Well, good morning and welcome to Maple Dale. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning as we turn in the Gospel of John to a place where the Jewish leaders are persecuting the believers who have come to faith in Christ because they have seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. That we understand that that same government theory, that same persecuting model, is alive and well in our own world today also. And Father, we pray that you might give us every opportunity as we gather together in this church and in many churches across the land to seek your face, to worship, to be your people, to do those things that you've asked us to do. That you would continue to place your hand upon us in such a way that we are able to do the things you ask. We're praying for divine sovereigns for your plan to be fulfilled in us. We're praying that we would be the people who are the praise of your glory and people who are faithful, uh, persevering until we can no longer do anything other than serve you in this world. And Father, I pray the word that I preached this morning from the Gospel of John might penetrate hearts, even hard hearts, Father, for the sake of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen and amen. Well, in our study, we have just seen Jesus perform one of the most spectacular miracles. And in the Gospel of John, these miracles are always called signs because they point to the fact that Jesus is God incarnate. He is the Son of God sent into this world to, uh, to redeem God's people. Uh, and he has raised his friend Lazarus from the dead after Lazarus had been entombed for four days. And, and what I've discovered in my years of ministry is that people in churches everywhere are enamored by the spectacular signs of God, and they seem to crave these spectacular signs. I mean, they want to see miracles, and for good reason. I mean, who wouldn't want to see, you know, a whole city full of people fed miraculously? And who wouldn't want water turned to wine whenever the occasion is right? And who, who doesn't desire a miraculous healing or tax money from the mouth of a fish or, or somebody raised from the dead right in front of their eyes? I mean, we would love to see those things happen. But I think the greatest ongoing miracle is one that we sometimes don't even see. It happens right in front of our eyes, and, and we almost take it for granted. What's that miracle? What's that sign? It's that Christ has made some of us alive with him by making us a brand new creation. We've been born again from above, and we are a new creation. We are redeemed. We are justified. We are placed in union with Christ. We're persevering in faith until the end. That may be the greatest miracle that a lot of us ever witness, and yet we, when we see that miracle, it's like, oh yeah, another, another one added to the church today. And, and we don't jump up and down, and we don't scream and run around like they certainly were doing when Lazarus was raised from the tomb that day. Because we fail to recognize sometimes that a dead person was made alive in that action of coming to the cross of Christ. Now we're jealous, in, in a good way, uh, for the physical resurrection of Lazarus. I mean, I mean and, and why not? Every single one of us has lost a loved one that we just wish could be brought back to us. Uh, but are we jealous for that spiritual rebirth? And is that our motivation? Just this past week on social media, there was a post, and, and there's always posts on social media, but uh, uh, this particular one was posted uh, on a group called SBC Pastors, uh, and, and the question was, what's the greatest miracle of Jesus? Well, we've just listed several, right? But my answer to that question is me. <laughs> because I'm just telling you, if Jesus can save me, he can save anybody. If I could be saved, then no one is beyond his reach. But again, the people there were looking for the spectacular miracles, miracles that keep us fat and happy and free from sickness, pockets full of money, find a new job, a new wife, a new car, you know, and 
uh, in a lot of cases, I just wonder what kind of false gospel has taken this whole world by captivity these days. You know, used to be we had false preachers in pulpits preaching that uh, it would always be sunny days and that a human utopia. Well, these days that gospel is preached by our government. But it's just as false. Now, there's a lot of people that would say, I've not been taken captive by a false gospel. And my response to that is, really? Are you sure? How does what you believe and what you hold and what you act on stack up against the one true gospel presented by the Holy Bible? And just as a for instance, I copied in the Mapledale's Facebook page this week a statement uh, made by Southern Baptist preacher and convention president, Dr. Adrian Rogers. Uh, in that meme it said, if your faith can't get you to church on Sunday, I doubt it'll get you into heaven. And that's something that he said in a sermon that he delivered. And more and more as I look around, I see that what he said is true. There are so many people claiming faith in Jesus, but their faith isn't big enough to get them in church on Sunday morning. There's another meme that was floating around this week that had a much more serious and, and more ominous tone because it dealt with the sure martyrdom of any number of Afghani believers. And yes, I, I want to tell you with assurance that there are Christian believers in Afghanistan. And there are many, many missionaries in that nation trying to reach people groups there. There are more than one people group. It's not just Taliban. There's all sorts of people groups in Afghanistan. In fact, the church in Afghanistan is the second fastest growing mission church in the world. Where it's the fastest one? Iran. Two of the least likely places on earth that we would expect God to be doing a work, and that's where God is doing a work. And people are dreaming dreams, and, and Christian missionaries are laying their life on the line in order that they might hear about what we take for granted Sunday after Sunday here in America, that Jesus Christ saves sinners. And in the face of sure death, these church members in Afghanistan have chosen to stay and meet rather than escape. And I was made privy of a phone call that a friend took where he was speaking on the phone with members in a house church in Afghanistan as the doors were beaten down and the shots rang out and the people screamed. And they took every, they killed every single one in that church and in that family except the 10-year-old daughter who was handed off to the, the Taliban leadership for whatever it is they do with 10-year-old girls. In the face of sure death, they would prefer to meet together and praise Jesus than, than scatter and separate and hide. Oh God, how we must pray for those people. They didn't get a rapture. But in some cases, God has given that miraculous gift of peace in the face of martyrdom. And trust me, no one in their right mind wants that gift. That's a gift of last resort. If, if you're facing the end of a rifle, that's when you want that gift. But God gives it when it's his plan to bring his people home to his glory. Now, back to our study in John. Uh, that's where we're headed, and, and some of these other things are just things in our world, and, and, and they, lay, they lay heavy on my heart, they, they lay he heavy on your hearts, I know they do. But Lazarus has been raised from the dead, and the people are surrounding him and Jesus and the family, and they're praising God for his mercy and his, base, his grace as Jesus bid Lazarus to raise up and come from that tomb. And, and, and then he asked the people to unwind Lazarus from his burial cloth. And one might think that such a miracle, such a powerful sign of this nature, demonstrating the power of Jesus Christ over life and death, would finally get the attention of the Jewish elders. And it did, but not the way that so many of us wish that it might have. John chapter 11, verse 45. 
Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, that is Jesus, believed in him. Yay, absolutely, wouldn't you? You see him raise a man from the dead? But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. <laughs> if only, right? And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, like I said, we might rightly expect a lot of people to become believers after seeing a sign like this. Jesus made it abundantly clear as he did this sign why he was doing it, in whose authority he was doing it. And he said this prayer that we just looked at last week, John eleven forty one. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me and I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. See, what Jesus did was intended to cause people to believe, and some did. But some, and there's always some, right? But some ran to the Jewish leaders at the temple and reported the actions of this interloper named Jesus. And what's their great fear? Well, well John does us the service of taking away any guessing on our part. We don't have to guess, verse 48, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now it's not that they haven't noticed the signs. They make note of the fact that they've seen him doing many signs. And they've been present for all the signs of Jesus. It's the fact that he's doing signs that is the problem for them. What do they fear? Everybody might believe in him. Well, isn't that God's plan? God so loved the world, right? That whosoever, that, that, that's Bible. Now we know that even starting with Nicodemus way back in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, that these Jewish leaders knew that Jesus was doing signs that demonstrate that he was sent from God. That's what Nicodemus, one of these Jewish leaders, said to Jesus at the night time. We know that you are a man sent from God because only a man sent from God can do what you're doing. Well, he's continued doing things that only a man sent from God can do. And instead of worshiping God for sending someone to them, they hated Jesus for being who he was. They hated him for bringing these signs, for demonstrating that God sent the man into their presence. And why did they hate him? Because this Jesus was upsetting their apple cart. He was, he was upsetting their life of luxury. He was take, going to take the place uh, of them in the hearts of the people. And once that happened, then they would no longer have all the life of luxury in the ancient world, uh, everything that that ancient world could provide, and, and they greatly feared that Rome would take over the whole nation of Israel. You see, if they weren't in charge, then the whole nation would fall. Ultimately, it would prove true uh, that while they were in charge, the whole nation fell. But these Jewish leaders in the temple, scholars of the Old Testament, uh, priests of God, feared government more than they feared God. And they feared the wrath of government more than they feared the wrath of God. And ironically, I find ourselves in the United States of America in the year 2021 in exactly the same place. We have more people fearing the wrath of government than we have fearing the wrath of God. Now before I get myself too deep into trouble, and I'm probably going to today, so just buckle up, I just want to say that government is important. And God tells us in Scripture 
to honor our government leaders, to pray for them, whether they're upright or whether they're evil. In Romans chapter 13 and others, uh, ask us to be good citizens of our nation, realizing that God raises up and casts down uh, leaders in government as he sees fit based on the plan that he's working. But there are some competing worldview philosophies that are doing exactly through our government what the Apostle Paul charged the church and the believers to not do. And, and I just want to turn to the Apostle Paul so we can see his explanation. Uh, it's Colossians chapter 2, 2. And he's talking to the believers there, and I'm picking this up in midstream, but this is the part I think we need to see. Uh, he's saying that the hearts of believers may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. So what's he saying here? That, that the mission of God is to make us one people, right? Knit together in love, to have full assurance of the fact that Jesus Christ is the mystery of God. Verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then he goes on to explain why he's saying that. Verse 4, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Now what are these plausible arguments? Well, the plausible arguments are the things, the, the philosophies that the world brings us, like critical race theory and others, that, that are separating people from this mission of God that we all be in love together under his banner. And they're doing that. They're doing it. It's a false gospel. Now, I just want to say that uh, people innately seem to understand, whether they're believers or non-believers, that being together in love is, is a prime importance in, in our world. Uh, whether someone is a Christian writing songs and, and poetry and books or an atheist writing songs and poetry and books, it seems like the theme of, of more than half of all the songs and poetry and books is how we should all love each other and come together. I mean, you can go John Lennon, who was about as far off the scale in one direction, or you can go to a great Christian worship song, and they're all talking about the same thing, being together in love. The only problem is one thinks that we can be together in love based on human power, and one thinks we can only be together in love based on the love of Christ, uh, that while we were yet sinners came and changed us and, and, and made us into the image and likeness of God. But some of these people that are striving to bring us together in love and acceptance are proposing for us a philosophy, a worldview, a, a plausible theory, so to speak, uh, as a means of controlling us and dictating and demanding to us what it looks like to be in love together with each other. And that's where they come up with these crazy theories that we're now struggling with in our world. But according to the Apostle Paul, and according to the best human wisdom, the whole idea is that we're together. Now Paul continues, Colossians 2.6. He said, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. And, and, and he's meaning that exclusively. Turn to Him. Turn to His kingdom. Don't follow the world. Walk in Him. Right? And he goes on, Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And he says, see to it, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, Christ, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. What's the apostle saying here? Well, he's saying that the world has philosophies. And those philosophies will work to take you from Christ, not to Christ. And it happens every time, and the philosophies are dividing family and dividing churches and dividing the nation. He continues, look at 2.16. And this is the heart. 
This is the heart of our world today. Verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from whom? Say it with me. From God, right? Verse 20, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to all things that perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity through the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, he's talking about all the, the, the various religious philosophies and feasts and festivals and do this and don't do that, and you can't go to heaven if you eat bacon and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but I think that the, the theme that he is laying out here in being captured by vain philosophies of the world can be transposed easily without violating the text of Scripture into where we stand today in our world. Everything that comes to us from the world is an effort to lead us far away from God and not to God and far away from the love for each other that God prescribes to us. Now the Jewish leaders had the same concerns, but what they were concerned about is how is it can we divide and conquer these people, control them, tax them, and if Jesus keeps preaching what he's preaching, they're all going to turn away and we're going to lose our power. We're all going to lose our authority. Well, wouldn't the same thing happen in the United States of America if God's church rose up and said, enough of this, we're done with this? We the people, it says in the Constitution. We the people, it says in the Word of God. That's, that's exactly the same thing. It's because the framers of the Constitution knew their Bibles. They were worried about losing the power to Rome. Well, I want to tell them something if they didn't already understand it. Rome already had the power. It already had them. And they were completely blind to the problems they face. And Jesus would have been their remedy, not their problem, but they failed to realize that. He was their remedy then, he is our remedy now. He is the antidote for critical race theory. He is the antidote for gender bending theories. He is the antidote for these false prophets that insist that everyone, everyone, everyone get on board with whatever it is comes our way mandated by a government who is no longer of the people. And this morning in America, while the church in Afghanistan burns and believers are made martyrs, we're staying home because some people are afraid. Some people didn't get the job. Some people did get the jab. Some people don't wear a mask. Some people do wear a mask. And what are we? We're afraid. And, and, and we're turning on each other because the government has made us afraid. Everything that happens here is ripping the church and ripping the country and ripping our family to shreds. But our government is just as influential as these Jewish religious leaders. And they cannot see Jesus for who he is, and they want to eliminate the threat to their own existence. But what did the apostles write in Romans chapter 3, verse 4? He said, by no means. Let God be true... Though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. The epitome of racism is to be called a racist because of the amount of melanin in one's skin. The epitome of racism is to be called something, you know, the N-word or whatever is used, because of the level of melanin in one's skin. And people have all sorts of levels of melanin, which is simply a substance in the cell that provides color. 
It has largely a lot to do with, with where your people were living, you know, in, in their heritage before they immigrated to wherever they live now or were carried or forced or whatever. We know that it is racist to decide that people are good or bad dep depending on the color of their skin. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. died to give that message to the world. But today, if you preach his message, the world will take you apart at the seams. Because critical race theory that has taken over our whole entire government and our whole entire world says that you cannot claim that as a white person and not be racist. You are only claiming that to protect your privilege. And if a black man claims that, well, he's just joined whitey. And how racist is it to say that of people? It's a false gospel offering a false hope, and it's only given so that one man will war against another man, and that is of the devil. It's not a political problem, it's a sin problem. Now back to John. We've got these chief priests, and, and they've got another idea, right? Let's sacrifice one guy so that we can all live. John chapter 11, verse 49. Now remember, they've been presented with the fact that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and they're worried about what to do. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Now he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one, uh, into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. And from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Now I find it so ironic that in one of the, one of the things in this world today is, is that God is not sovereign. It's one of the reasons I left that group, SBC Pastors, this week, because it was argument after argument after ar argument that God is not sovereign, that God cannot do what he intends to do, he cannot plan what he intends to plan, uh, that only the free will of man stands on the throne above all. Well, here we find God being sovereign because he takes this godless chief priest and uses this chief priest for his own good, and, and he causes this chief priest who is against the very Son of God standing in his presence to prophesy a word of truth for the sake of the kingdom of God. If that doesn't demonstrate that God is sovereign over everybody, then I don't know what does. And this evil chief priest is promoting the idea that if we kill this one man, that we will survive everything else. He's our problem. <coughs> Now, just a little side note here. I just, I just want to share this with you. A.D. 70, roughly 35 years after the crucifixion of the one that they thought was their problem, Rome crushed Israel because these same chief priests and elders of Jerusalem of the temple led Israel on a march against Rome. And Rome shattered that nation to where there was no two stones standing on top of each other. However, Caiaphas had absolutely no clue that he was doing the bidding of God as, as he said these words and, and as he made these decisions. And ultimately, Jesus would die at the hands of both the Romans and the Jews, but his death was the plan of God to redeem the world. His death and resurrection are the hope of a world gone mad. They are the hope of the Afghani believers. They are the hope of those who are deemed racist simply because they're people of privilege instead of people of oppression. They're the hope of all those long-trusted uh, human beings for salvation when the whole world would sell them out for a pittance. Now, they made plans to put Jesus to death, and ultimately they would succeed. But as we are going to see as we continue forward in John's Gospel is that Jesus was actually in charge of every step 
every aspect of what was happening, and it was based on his timetable and his decision because he came to this world to lay down his life for the flock. He is the good shepherd. He is the Lord of glory, and there is none like him. But as long as the people, as they did that day Lazarus was raised to, from the dead, turn to government instead of to God, they will always ultimately end up crushed instead of saved. Jesus took leave of his people at that point. He went back to the hills of his homeland. He removed himself from all the political drama and all the palace intrigue. He had that option in that moment. We likely don't have that same option. We can't just pick up and leave. In fact, I counseled someone yesterday, and that individual thought that their best hope was just to get to somewhere where there was nobody around. And what I told him is even if you get to where you're, there's nobody around, you still got you, and your problems are going to be right home square where you think they are. We don't have a problem. We, we are here where we live. This is our church. And we want to fight for the right to love our, our Christ, our King, and to go into the public square and proclaim the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ saves sinners. But the time is coming for us too where the persecution that we've been fearing for so many years and that we sometimes think is already upon us, not yet, but soon, it will come full force. But like dominoes, our world is seeing nation after nation after nation toppling as the people are taken captive. Not for the gospel, but for these vain human philosophies and for the subjugation of a people under powerful central rule. Now I want to wrap up with a promise that the Apostle Paul gave us. And he shared this in Ephesians, which is, if we know our Bibles, we, we understand that Ephesians uh, is the book that the Apostle wrote where he essentially taught us essential doctrines about spiritual warfare and how it is that we're supposed to live based on the power that indwells us through Christ the King. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle lays out the whole case here, the whole gospel. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, once walked, following the course of what? This world, right? Following the prince of the power of the air. In other words, that's the demonic realm or whatever. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So he's first telling us who we were, okay? We were sinners, living according to the way the devil would have us live. But then look at verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, he's talking about the end of days now, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now there are a lot of people in the church that are boasting about their salvation boasting about their ability to do church work and how many souls they can reap and how good they are. It's not our work. That's why in this church we've learned to say that we trust in God to do the things that only God can do. Now he calls us to do that work. And the apostle is calling us to do that work. But we don't boast in that work except to boast that Christ is our king and we are his children and that's our boast. Amen? Verse 10, he explains why. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, in other words, everybody who's not Jewish, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's who we were. Verse 13, this is who we are. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and expressed in ordinances that he may create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body and through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Here he's talking about all the things that divide us as human beings and saying that in the cross, in the resurrection, we're made one, one body, one bride that will ultimately present it to Christ spotless and blameless at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Verse 17, and he came, Jesus came, and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access and one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, and in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In that I can find no room for the division that our, Lord, that our world is fostering upon us. No room for the sort of radical Marxist critical theory that is being uh, just literally brainwashed into heads of our students and schools. No room for this concept that only one sort of lives matter when in fact all lives matter. And I am not a white oppressor for saying that because according to God all lives do matter. They matter so much he sent his son to die. Amen. And that's why in this church, in this pastor, will proclaim the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a political issue, it's a sin issue. And God help us, there is so much sin in this world. And unfortunately, so much of the sin in this world is masquerading as Christian care and Christian kindness. It is not Christian care and Christian kindness to divide people into classes so as to create warfare. That is Antichrist. There's a lot more I could say about this. And if you want to know more, come and see me privately. But our king is Christ, not government, not Marx, not oppressed and oppressor. Our king is Christ. He unites us as one people, one blood, one cross, one resurrection, one baptism, one Lord's table that he invites us to come and remember how it is that he procured for us his great salvation. While we were yet sinners, the apostle wrote, Christ died for us. He broke his body so that we don't have to. He shed his blood so that we can have the remission of sins. And that is, in fact, why we come together to remember. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I am well aware of the fact, Lord God, that people are so confused because they're presented with a vain philosophy of the world that has them so boxed in that they can't see any outlet. No matter which way one turns, they are ultimately deemed a sinner and there is no hope for repentance in the false gospel of this world. But Heavenly Father, in Christ Jesus the Lord who came and died in our place, there is a possibility for repentance, there is a possibility for faith, and there is a possibility for salvation because he ensured that those would be true. And Father, I pray now for the confused ones hearing this message uh, who think that, th that the whole church stands in a place of being an oppressor 
We are not the oppressors. We wield no authority. We have no power except to say, come and meet Jesus the Savior and let him do the work in you that only the Son of God can do. And Father, I pray that you will knit this church together in spirit, in love, in harmony, in faith as we walk the path prescribed for us by the Word of God. And Father, I understand that that is going to become more and more difficult in the days ahead. But Father, you can give us the same faith that you're giving to Afghani Christians right now. And Father, we cry out on their behalf to your very throne. Father, redeem us and secure us and give us faith and perseverance to walk the course of this world until we meet you face to face. And we pray then, Father, that our names have been written into the Lamb's book of life. Father, bless you and praise you and be with us now in our time of remembrance. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen.